we move on to the next one, which is sector. Now, with zoning, we're talking about human energy, which is there on the site, and it's centred at some point on the site, maybe in the middle, maybe on an edge, but it, it sort of gradually gets less as you go away from that centre of human attention. With sector, we're looking at energy that comes in from outside. So, for example, wind, a very important one. Light and shade, water, pollution in some cases. Neighbours. Helpful neighbours and unhelpful neighbours. <laughs> Views. Both the view that you have of the surrounding area and also the view that you're creating for other people to see of your place or even internal views. So those kinds of things. And any energy that's coming in from outside. Um, that sector. And... This brings up the concept of microclimate, which I'll be showing you more about tomorrow. Mm, uh, just write that up. The microclimate is, have I spelled it wrong? Climate. Climb eight. <laughs> I'm a bit dyslexic on the board. <laughs> um, microclimate is the climate of a small area. So I expect most of you have realised that, that here we're on the edge of a, of a deep valley with a large river in the bottom of it. Well, that valley has its own climate, which is different from the surrounding hills. Um, you know, it's, it, it's much more humid. It's much colder in the winter because the cold air falls down and so you get frost and mists and so forth in the valley, uh, which you don't get on the hilltops. So that's a difference in microclimate. But you can have a microclimate on a much smaller scale than that. Like you could say, you could talk about the microclimate of this little yard out here. You could even talk about the microclimate of one square metre in, in a sunny corner of it, which might be quite different from the that of another square metre in a shady part of it. So those are microclimates and they're very important. Um, one of the ways in which we can make our systems more productive is by observing microclimates and then using the different microclimates available for the appropriate things, putting the most tender plants in the best microclimates and the toughest plants in the toughest microclimates. And so that, that's very important. And this often blends with uh, zone. Now the concept of sector often needs to be balanced with that of zone. So, for example, I told you about uh, the advantage of having your productive plants right outside the kitchen window. Well, if that just happens to be the shadiest place in your entire garden, I'm not suggesting you should say, ah, Patrick said we've got to have our vegetables outside the kitchen window. No, no, never mind about the light and shade. Of course you don't. You balance those two factors up, one against the other, and, and, and you make your decision according to the unique situation that you've got. Every situation is unique. And so I can't give you off-the-peg answers to these things. All I can do, as I said yesterday, is suggest what are the right questions to ask. So, uh, it's microclimate. In general, I would say that on, on a domestic scale, you know, when you're talking about a, a home garden, light and shade tends to be very important because you've got a house or possibly neighbours' houses as well, casting shade. It's often a lot of trees. Uh, whereas on a, a larger scale, in talking about several hectares, wind becomes very important. 
and we'll be looking at wind specifically later on in the course. Okay, so that's sector, that's number two. Number three is network. Network is a bit like zoning, except it's where you've got more than one centre of human attention. And it's about access and connecting up different centres of attention. So I'll give you an example, which comes from David Holmgren. When he designed his small holding, about one hectare, shaped something like that, um, this is north over here, being in Australia, that's where the sun comes from. And over here was his house with uh, intensive vegetable beds right outside it. Over here he had a barn where he kept chickens, machinery, things like that. But also there was a, an exceptionally fertile piece of soil there. So he thought, yeah, well I'll use that for intensive growing as well, or perhaps slightly less intensive than what he's got outside the house. Then also, there was a place down here where they thought, if we ever want to build another house, that's the place where we'll do it. That's quite often an important thing in permaculture design, actually, to look at potentials as well as things that you want to do immediately. And they've got a little garden there where they, they grow vegetables for permaculture design courses. So they just grow vegetables specifically for that purpose there. Now, in between there's all sorts of things. There's orchards and um, ponds, grazing for his goats and that kind of thing, which I won't draw in. But as part of his design process, he had to look at the access between these three places um, you know what's the easiest way to get from one to the other what kind of access do we need you know do we need just foot access or does it need to be for animals as well or does it need to be for vehicles does it need to be all the year round or just in the summer so there's all these questions that, that need to be answered so network is often very much about access. It's not usually relevant on smaller sites, you know, on, the, on a domestic site where you've just got the house and garden. There's usually just one centre of human attention. Uh, so it's more for sort of, well, this is one hectare, and so one hectare upwards is really uh, more likely that network will be relevant. Mm -hmm.